Shalom, Malekum, peace be upon you, and welcome back to the broadcast. I'm Sean. Website is scriptureandprophecy.com. That's where you go to find the archives. That's where you go to support this mission of truth. Well, this morning we're going to look at this week's Torah portion, uh, which is called Balak. And let me uh, just read you the portion summary real quick. Balak was the name of the Moabite king in the day of Moses. It is also the name of the 14th reading from the Torah. It comes from the second verse of this, week's, of this week's reading, which says, Now Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. This week's Torah portion reading tells the story of how Balak hires the occult prophet Balaam to lay a curse on Israel. Balaam meets resistance from God, has a conversation with his donkey, and ends up blessing Israel instead of cursing them. So you kind of have this, uh, as the TorahPortions.org describes him, this occult prophet. And uh, the Jews have had their problem with occult, big time, and still do to this day. Um, which is a whole other study and a whole other issue to talk about, but... This story here, uh, Balaam's Donkey, is a story that most of us are familiar with, at least on some level. Uh, in the King James, it's, it's probably the most famous. And in fact, we should read it out of the King James this morning. Um, also, uh, just so you know, I've been out of town all week, so I haven't had time to pre-read and do an in-depth in -depth study like I typically do. Uh, so this morning I'm just going to be uh, reading and uh, hopefully God's word will just come out and uh, maybe God will share some things with us um, as we're reading. Uh, but I don't have any nuggets of wisdom or anything like that prepared for you this morning. We're just going to read the story and uh, I'm sure you'll be blessed nonetheless. So... Without any further delay, we're reading from Numbers 22, verse 2, to 25, verse 9. Let's begin. 22, verse 2. And Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. And Moab was sore afraid of the people because they were many. And Moab was distressed because of the children of Israel. And Moab said unto the elders of Midian, Now shall this company lick up all that are round about us, as the ox licketh up the grass of the field. And Balak the son of Zippor was king of the Moabites at that time. He sent messengers therefore unto Balaam the son of Beror to Pethor, which is by the river of the land of the children of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt. Behold, they cover the face of the earth, and they abide over against me. Come now, therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people, for they are too mighty for me. Peradventure I shall prevail, that we may smite them, and that I may drive them out of the land. For I wot that he, whom, that he whom thou blessest is blessed, and he whom thou curses is cursed. And the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian departed with the rewards of divination in their hand. And they came to Balaam and spake unto him the words of Balak. And he said unto them, Lodge here this night, and I will bring you word again, as the Lord shall speak unto me, and the princes of Moab abode with Balaam. And God came unto Balaam and said, What men are these with thee? And Balaam said unto God, Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, has sent me, says, sent unto me, saying, Behold, there is a people come out of Egypt, which covereth the face of the earth. Come now, curse them, peradventure I shall be able to overcome them and drive them out. God said unto Balaam, Thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not curse the people, for they are blessed. And Balaam rose up in the morning, and said unto the prince of Balak, Get you into your land, for the Lord refuses to give me leave 
to go with you. And the princes of Moab rose up, and they went unto Balak, and said, Balaam refuses to come with us. And Balak sent again, and again princes more and more honorable than they. And they came to Balaam and said to him, Thus saith Balak, the son of Zippor, Let nothing, I pray thee, hinder thee from coming unto me, for I will promote thee unto very great honor. And I will do whatsoever thou sayest unto me. Come therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. And Balaam answered and said unto the servants of Balak, If Balak would give me his house full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord my God. Which, in, by the way, in Hebrew, we're reading from the King James. But even though that Balaam doesn't appear to be part of Israel, he still somehow serves Jehovah. Because it's not the Lord my God, as it shows in the King James. It's Jehovah Elohim. So, so it's talking about Jehovah personally, that the one true God. And Balaam's saying, look, you, no matter how much money you offer me, it's not going to change the fact that these people are blessed by Jehovah Elohim. And he's saying that they're blessed and there's nothing, there's no amount of money in the world that's going to change that. Right? He says, I cannot go beyond the word of the Lord of Jehovah, my Elohim, to do less or more. Now therefore I pray you, tarry ye also here this night, that I may know what the Lord will say unto me more. God came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them, but yet the word which I shall say unto thee, that shall thou do. And Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the prince of Moab. And God's anger was kindled because he went. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. Now he was riding upon his ass, and his two servants were with him. And he saw an angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand, and the ass turned aside out of the way, and went into the field, and Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. Now, please know before we move any further, it's, it's admittedly strange, right? I mean, Jehovah appears to Balaam, or speaks to him, says that God came to Balaam at night and said unto him, If the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, thou shalt do. So he says, if they ask you to go with them, go with them, but you do what I tell you to do. Balaam gets up to go, and just like he was told, right? Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass, and he went with the prince of Moab. Just like God had said. And then, verse 22, and God's anger was kindled when he went, because he went. <laughs> and so these are the kind of things that can get uh, challenging to understand, can't they? God says go, but then he's mad that he went. But it's all really about God's divine will, right? Uh, and that's always, it's never really uh, easy for us to try to comprehend. Now, according to Jewish commentary, like if we look at uh, the Kamash here, there's a couple of uh, theories. One is uh, that it, well, really both theories here describe the issue being Balaam's enthusiasm, right? It's, it's almost like they believed that, hey, deep down Balaam wanted to do the thing uh, because he kind of wanted the, the gold and, and the wealth and, and all the bribes that were coming. Uh, now, God says, go with him, and so he's enthusiastic about it. He, ride, he rises early, he saddles his own ass, and he's ready to go. Uh, that's kind of what, if I'm looking at this uh, Jewish kamash, that's, that's kind of what they said. Uh, Balaam went with God's permission, but, as discovered above, with the hope, if not the outright intention, of flouting his will, to show him and his Moabite escort that he was powerless to act on his own, God dispatched an angel to block his way. That he was unable to see the angel to the very end of this mission while his donkey sensed or saw it. 
was a refutation of his brazen boast that he knew God's will and he was his spokesman. So uh, that's kind of the idea. Balaam's enthusiasm contemptuously. Hatred causes people to violate norms of conduct. Surely it was not fitting for a man of Balaam's stature to saddle his own donkey, but he hated Israel so much that he did not let dignity stand in his way and even got up early in the morning to do it. So that's kind of their uh, way of trying to understand this. It's, yes, God told him to do it, but uh, his, his enthusiasm or his heart about it is what may have kindled God's anger, but of course we're speculating. So, do with that as you will. Let me finish the story. Uh, so now we've got the angel blocking the way, right? Let's go back to verse 23. And he asked Saul, the angel of the Lord, standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand, and the ass turned aside out of the way, and went into the field, and the Balaam smote the ass to turn her into the way. But the angel of the Lord stood in a path of the vineyard, a wall being on this side, and a wall on that side. And when he asked Saul, the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself unto the wall and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall, and he smote her again. And the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam, and Balaam's anger was kindled, and he smote the ass with a staff. And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass, and she said unto, and she said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten me these three times? And Balaam said unto the ass, Because thou hast mocked me, I would there were a sword in my hand, for now I will kill thee. And the ass said unto Balaam, Am I not thine ass upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day? Was I ever wont to do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand, and he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. Please note a couple of things. Number one, sometimes uh, <laughs> I wonder how many times for each of us that we've been trying to do something and it's not working out and it's failing and we're getting frustrated and we can't see that there's an angel that God has dispatched an angel to prevent us for our own good or, to, or how many times has God sent rescue that you have no idea about that's kind of the thoughts that's come to my mind Balaam can't see this his donkey can, and he's mad because the donkey's not doing what the donkey's supposed to do. So he's beating the donkey. And he can't see the angel that God has dispatched to stand in his way. So that's kind of the first thought. The second thought is, Balaam doesn't go, Whoa, my donkey's talking. I find that interesting as well. Many of you have probably listened to some of the podcasts I've done, specifically from the book of Jubilees, and it's something I need to write about in a, in a book in the future, because I don't know anyone else who has taught this, and so maybe I'm just way off base, but I believe, and the book of Jubilees flat out says it, and you can go to my YouTube channel and search for this, uh, that the animals, at least before the flood, could talk. Uh, and that's according to the book of Jubilees. Also, notice Adam and Eve never raised the question. Why is there a talking serpent? Well, yeah. Eve just converses with it. And so when I read the story of Balaam, even though it's after the flood, and I still, this, uh, that comes to mind just because he never asked the question either. Why is this donkey talking? But anyway, that's for a different conversation. Like I said, I've done videos on it. I'm going to write about it at some point. Uh, let's continue on. Uh, verse 31, Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand, and he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. 
And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass? These three times, behold, I went out and withstand thee, because the way is perverse before me. And the ass saw me, and he turned from me these three times. Unless he had turned from me, surely now also have I had slain thee and saved her alive. And Balaam said unto the angel of the Lord, I have sinned, for I knew not that thou stoodest in the way against me. Now therefore, if it displease thee, I will get me back again. And the angel of the Lord said unto Balaam, Go with the men, but only the word that I shall speak unto thee, that thou shalt speak. So Balaam went with the prince of Balak. When Balak heard that Balaam was come, he went out to meet him unto the city of Moab, which is in the border of Aran, Arnon, which is the uttermost coast. And Balak said to Balaam, Did I not earnestly send unto thee and call thee? Wherefore camest thou not unto me? Am I not able indeed to promote thee to honor? And Balaam said unto Balak, Lo, I am come unto thee. Have I now any power at all to say anything? The word that God putteth in my mouth, that shall I speak. And Balaam went with Balak, and they came unto Kirjath Hazath. And Balak offered oxen and sheep, and sent Balaam and the two princes that were with him. And it came to pass on the morrow that Balak took Balaam and brought him up to the high places of Baal, that thence he might see the uttermost part of the people. So now Balaam's with Balak. And Balak takes him up to see Baal, the people of Baal, the occultists, the Satanists. Let's continue on. Chapter 23. And Balaam said unto Balak, Build me here seven altars, and prepare me here seven oxen and seven rams. And Balak did as Balaam had spoken, and Balak and Balaam offered on every altar a bullock and a ram. And Balaam said unto Balak, Stand by the burnt offering, and I will go. Peradventure the Lord will come to meet me, and whatsoever he showeth me I will tell thee. And he went to a high place, and God met Balaam. And he said unto him, I have prepared seven altars, and I have offered upon every altar a bullock and a ram. And the Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth, and said, Return unto Balak, and Thus shalt thou shalt speak. And he turned unto him, and lo, he stood by the burnt sacrifice, he and all the princes of Moab. And he took up his parable, and he said, Balak, the king of Moab, hath brought me from Aram out of the mountains of the east, saying, Come, curse me, Jacob, and come defy Israel. How shall I curse whom God hath not cursed? Or how shall I defy whom the Lord hath not defied? For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. And lo, the people shall dwell alone, and shall not be reckoned among the nations. Who can count the dust of Jacob, and all the number of the fourth part of Israel? Let me die the death of the righteous, and let me last end be like his. And Balak said to Balaam, What hast thou done to me? I took thee to curse my enemies, and behold, thou hast blessed them altogether. And he answered and he said, Must I not take heed to speak that which the Lord hath put in my mouth? And Balak said unto him, Come, I pray thee, with me to another place from thence, from whence thou may see them. Thou shalt see but the utmost part of them, and shalt not see them all, and curse me them from thence. And he brought him up to the field of Zophim, of Zophim to the top of Pisgah and built seven altars, and offered a bullock and a ram on every altar. And he said unto Balak, Stand here by the burnt offering, while I meet the Lord yonder. And the Lord met Balaam, and he put a word in his mouth, and he said, Go again unto Balak, and say thus. And when he came to him, behold, he stood by his burnt offering, and the prince of Moab with him. And Balak said unto him, What hath the Lord spoken? And he took up his parable, and he said, Rise up, Balak, and hear, hearken unto me, thou son of Zephor. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent, hath he said? And shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall not make it good? Behold, I have received commandment to bless. 
and he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse it. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and sh the shout of a king is among them. God brought them out of Egypt, and he hath, he hath as it were, the strength of a unicorn. Please note, first of all, we have, one of, we have a very famous verse here, right? God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? And also, the King James Bible here says that Israel has the strength of a unicorn, which I think at that time must have existed. Continuing on. Uh, God brought them out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. Verse 23, Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any divination against Israel. According to this time shall it be said of Jacob, and of Israel, what hath God wrought? Behold, the people shall rise up as a great lion, and lift up himself as a young lion, and he shall not lie down until he eat of the prey, and drink the blood of the slain. And Balak said unto Balaam, Neither curse them at all, nor bless them at all. But Balaam answered and said unto Balak, Told not I thee, saying, All that the Lord speaketh that I must do? And Balak said unto Balaam, Come, I pray thee, I will bring thee unto another place, preadventure it will please God, that thou mayest curse them from thence. And Balak brought Balaam unto the top of Peor, and looketh toward Jeshimon. And Balaam said unto Balak, Build me here seven altars, and prepare me here seven bullocks and seven rams. And Balak did as Balaam had said, and offered a bullock and a ram on every altar. So please note before we start chapter 24 here. Balak just keeps taking Balaam to different heights, hoping that the location's going to matter. It's such ignorance. It's like, well, God won't curse him here. Maybe if we go to this location, God will curse him. And this is just kind of the mindset of the occult, where it's like, if we do it, if we do it this way and in this manner, maybe we'll get the result we want. Instead of understanding that God is a is a Yes, he's a spirit, but he's a person. And he's not going to change. He's unchangeable. Based in, and he's certainly not going to change because you stood at a certain place in the world. But that is what is happening here. Balak just keeps taking Balaam to different places. But God has given Balaam the same instruction, which is to bless Israel. Let's continue on. Chapter 24. And when Balaam saw that it was that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he went not, as at other times, to seek for enchantments, but he set his face toward the wilderness. And Balaam lifted up his eyes, and he saw Israel abiding in his tents according to their tribes, and then the Spirit of God came upon him. And he took up his parable, and he said, Balaam, the son of Beor, hath said, and the man whose eyes are open hath said, He hath said, which heard the words of God, which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance, but having his eyes open. How goodly are these tents, O Jacob, and thy tabernacle, O Israel! As the valleys are, they spread forth, as gardens by the riverside, as the trees of lion aloes, which the Lord hath planted, and as cedar trees beside the waters. He shall pour the water out of his buckets, and his seed shall be in many waters. And his king shall be higher than Agag, and the kingdom shall be exalted. God brought him forth out of Egypt. He hath, as it were, the strength of a unicorn. He shall eat up the nations, his enemies, and shall break their bones, and pierce them among with his arrows. He crouched, he lay down as a lion. And as a great lion, who shall stir him up? Blessed is he that blesses thee, and cursed is he that curses thee. And Balak's anger was kindled against Balaam, and he smote his hands together. And Balak said unto Balaam, I called thee to curse my enemies, and behold, thou hast altogether blessed them these three times. Therefore now flee thou to thy place I brought to promote thee unto great honor. But lo! The Lord hath kept thee back from honor. 
And Balaam said unto Balak, Spake I not also to thy messengers which thou sentest unto me, saying, If Balak would give me his house of full of silver and gold, I cannot go beyond the commandment of the Lord, to do either good or bad of my own mind? But what the Lord saith that I will speak? And now, behold, I go unto my people. Come therefore, and I will advise thee what this people shall do to thy people in the latter days. And as he took up his parable, and he said, Balaam the son of Beor hath said, and the man whose eyes are open hath said, He hath said, which heard the words of God, who knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty falling into a trance, and having his eyes open, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Sheth. And Edom shall be a possession, Seir also shall be a possession for his enemies, and Israel shall do valiantly. Out of Jacob shall come that shall come he that shall have dominion, and shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. And when he looked on Amalek, he took up his parable and said, Amalek was the first of the nations, but his latter end shall be that he perish forever. And he looked on the Canaanites and took up his parable and said, Strong is thy dwelling place, and thou puttest thy nest in a rock. Nevertheless, the Kenites shall be wasted until a sure shall carry thee away captive. And he took up his parable and he said, Alas, who shall live when God doeth this? And ships shall come from the coast of Chitin, and shall afflict Ashur, and shall afflict Eber, and shall per they shall perish forever. And Balaam rose up, and he went, and he returned to his place. And Balak also went his way. So now we have nine more verses from chapter 25. And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods. People did eat and bow down to their gods. And Israel joined himself in the bow pure. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, Take all the heeds of the people and hang them up before the Lord against the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. And Moses said unto the judges of Israel, Slay you every one his men that were joined unto Baal Peer. Behold, one of the children of Israel came and brought unto his brethren a Medashus woman in the sight of Moses and in the sight of all the congregation and the children of Israel who were weeping before the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And when the Phinehas the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it. He rose up from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand. And he went after the man of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through, the man of Israel and the woman through the belly, so that the plague was stayed from the children of Israel. And those that died in the plague were twenty and four thousand. That's the actual end <laughs> how the portion ends it ends with not really that um, you know Balaam cursed or they or that the or that Balak found a way to overcome Israel how does Israel start to have problems it's kind of what's happened to the church today the church Israel here has gone after apostasy. Gone after the way of Baal. So it says, And Israel abode in Shittim, and the people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. Sexual immorality. Not only is it sexual immorality, but it's sexual immorality outside of God's ways and outside of God's people. And listen, verse 2, And they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods, and the people did eat and bowed down to their gods. So we've got idolatry. And Israel joined himself unto Baal, pure. 
And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Let me end here uh, with some commentary from Matthew Henry on this last part. Matthew 25, verses 1, or sorry, I said Matthew 25. Numbers 25, 1 through 5. He says, The friendship of the wicked is more dangerous than their enmity, for none can prevail against God's people if they are not overcome by their inbred lust, nor can any enchantment hurt them. But the enticements of worldly interest and pleasures. This is important to note. And this is, I would say, the main lesson we can glean from today's study. The occult has been doing this forever. And they do it now. Where they try to harm God's people and overcome God's people and prevail against God's people through enchantments and, 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 and all these things. But at the end of the day, there's only one way to hurt God's people, and that's for God's people to decide on their own to give in to their lust and to fall for the tricks and the trinkets of this world. Let me read this again. The friendship of the wicked is more dangerous than their enmity. enmity. For none can prevail against God's people if they are not overcome by their inbred lust, nor can any enchantments hurt them, but the enticements of worldly interest and pleasures. He goes on to say, Here is the sin of Israel, to which they are enticed by the daughters of Moab and Midian. Those are our worst enemies who draw us to sin, for that is the greatest mischief any man can do to us. Israel's sin did that which all Balaam's enchantments could not do. It set God, it set God against them. Disease are the fruits of God's anger and just punishments of prevailing sins. One infection follows another. Ringleaders in sin ought to be made examples of justice. You see, this that's the difference that Matthew Henry's pointing out. When the enemies... You know, they do enchantments and do things against us. That, the reason that doesn't work is because that doesn't turn God against us. And he's more powerful than any demonic power, any occult presence. What turns God against us is when we are lured by the world, by the prophets of Baal, to sin. When we're lured away by pornography. When we're lured away by lust. When we're lured away by covetousness. While we're lured away by these little trinkets that lead to nothing but death. That's when it turns God against us. And that's when we find ourselves in real trouble. I pray that you've been blessed this morning. I apologize that I had not had time to do pre-reading and pre-studying. And I'm sure there's a lot here that had I had the time to do that, that we could have discussed. But I also didn't want to just skip our end of week podcasting. So I did the best that I could for this week. And I pray that it still goes forth and pierces hearts and causes you to draw closer to God. And hopefully there's been something from this morning's study uh, that's spoken to you. And uh, it's something that you can chew on and dwell on. I want to thank you for your support. Thank you for your prayers. Peace and grace be with all of you, and until next time, God bless.